Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. This is a very small piece of the mini mill that I'm building. And if ever there was a perfect uh, part for demonstrating how important order of operations is, it would be this piece right here. The biggest diameter on this piece is 0.187. That's about four and a half millimeters for all you metric fans out there. This is the same old, same old 094 square that I've been broaching in some of the other parts. And this part is about 437 long which isn't very big. Anyway, I'm going to roll the model back. This software I'm using is Pro Engineer Wildfire 4.0. I believe it's a Creo release right now by a company called Parametric Technology Corporation. At least they owned it last time I looked. They do have a module on this or a, or a feature on this called a model player. I'm going to engage that. Now the model player allows you to look at the part and figure out what the guy was thinking that designed it and possibly come up with some ideas on how to produce the part. Well, I made this part exactly the way I'm going to produce it so I can demonstrate the order of operations and why. So let's go. Start off with no material. Go searching through the shop. Find yourself a piece of stock. There you go. 3 16 diameter cold roll. This is actually supplied with this particular mini mill kit. It has six inch length. I'm going to make one of these handles on either end of this length just because it's easier to hold. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the diameter on the end equal to the diameter of the ball that's going to be formed in this area. Uh, because it's really strong right now and doesn't have any neck down areas, I'm going to put the nose radius on the front of it. Okay, This will ultimately be a spherical feature on the end, but so I don't want to snap this off, I didn't put the undercut on first, I put the radius on first. Now I'll put the undercut on and I'll finish off the back side of the ball. All right, now we have a 125 diameter ball with an 070. That's about a sixteenth of an inch. That is really small. Sixteenth of an inch stem holding a 125 ball. Now you can see if you tried to turn this radius on the nose of this with this holding on, 50-50 whether or not it's going to walk up over top of your radius tool and blow up. You could also use a file on it if you really wanted to. Next thing in my order of operations is to put the front radius on what will be the center part of the handle. This is as far as I'm going to take it in the lathe. I'm going to take it over and put it on the mill and put it in a spin indexer. Spin indexer will allow me to access both sides of this part for the flats on the center ball and the flats on the nose ball. While it's still in the spin indexer and locked in one of these horizontal plane positions, I can put the hole in for the handle and I can put the pilot hole in for the brooch. You can see I have a substantial cross-section of material back here for the broaching operation, so that's next. Once the broaching operation is complete, that's as far as you can take it on the mill, so we're going to go back to the lathe with it, and we're going to put the undercut in the back side of what will be the center ball. So there's the undercut. Now I'm going to finish the radius on the back. If there was any part of this handle, that would be the one where you're just going to be ever so careful. It is this part right here. So when I put the radius on this corner, you're going to push your luck with the size of the material contact versus the size of the support material. And hopefully you're going to come up with something that looks like that. Very next step in the process, turn the raw material blank to the diameter of the third diameter present on this handle. So that'll be the next one. We neck that down. Now I'm going to put the radius on the leading edge of the internal corner of that. Now I'm going to part it off. You can, at your discretion, plunge an undercut tool in this, leaving some support material like this, file this round, and then finish cutting it off and just buff the round on if you want to. But I have a split bushing that has a 187 diameter hole in it and a 125 diameter stepped hole like a counterbore. And it holds these things perfectly, so I'm just going to part this thing off right now. what it's going to look like after it comes parted off. I will flip it around in the lathe, put it in my split bushing, re-engage the tool, and boom, done. And at that point, you just deburr it, polish it up, and make it happen. Now, as far as these tools are concerned, you've got an inner and outer radius on all three sizes. And the last thing you want is six different tools in order to do a part that's so small. <laughs> Good piece of advice here, people. If you're going to make a part that looks like this, Make a couple of them and put a few of them in the box because the next time it rolls around, you're going to scratch your head looking for those tools if you didn't put them on the side 
or you're going to kick yourself for not making six of them when you had it set up. So make a couple of extras. It's really not a big deal. So the split bushing, like I said, the split bushing will hold it on these two diameters and allow full access to the end. Allow you to polish it up and be done with it. As far as the tooling is concerned, which I was saying, you have an inner and outer radius for each one of these features. If you need to use the same tool, just simply flip the tool over because when you go from inner to outer, the tool will invert and then just run the machine in reverse. So you can make a full ball with one tool if the tool is ground to only cut 90 degrees worth of that ball. I think that's a very good piece of advice. And as far as making the tool, don't know if I already said this, but if you don't have a set of radius gauges and you're trying to grind a tool for a specific radius, find a piece of raw material or turn yourself a blank and use the blank itself as the radius gauge. Just push the material up against the profile that you have ground and look for light to be creeping through. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can make it perfect with a file and emery after the fact. So there you go. Let's get out to the machine, pop this in, do some time lapse and take a look at the finished product. Let's go. Once you've got your material loaded in the machine, let's face it off. This will be the digital readout zero point. I'm going to turn it down to 130 and I'm going to go back and turn it down to 125. That's the final diameter of the front ball. Very much like the animation, the front radius is next. Then the undercut to the back side of the front ball, front ball being the 125 diameter, that is an 070 neck right there, 070. Establishing the width, the final diameter, and drawing the face out. Backside radius of the 125 diameter in the front. And it looks a little bit more like a ball now. Front half of the 187 diameter, 093 radius added to the section right there. Clean it up. And that's about as far as we're going to take it right now. Hey guys, real time, four minutes and 58 seconds. All the tools were coordinated prior to shooting this video. There are end preps on each side of this blank so that I can take it over to the mill. And as shown in the digital representation, we're going to put the flats on, put the holes in, put the brooch square hole in the center. Let's do it. Whenever you load a piece of material in a spin indexer, make sure the projection is adequate so that none of the tools crash into the index wheel and everything has room. I always indicate the concentricity. Give it a little bump if you need to, to get it to run within what you're looking for to be acceptable. This is about 5 tenths. And I'm going to sweep the outside of the front and rear of this part to locate this center line. Once you got the center line, I'm going to use a pin of an established diameter because it's a round versus a round. So there is a point of contact that will pinch that paper. Knowing the diameter of the pin and the thickness of the paper, it's an easy calculation to find where you need to be. Superficial cuts on either side at 180 degrees apart. I will stop the machine, get the mic in there, take a reference measurement. I'm shooting for 125, so if you're paying attention to the barrel of the mic, Watch for the zero reading on the next measurement check. Little Z-axis adjustment. And the final pass. 125 is the target. Yep, 125. Going to raise the table a little bit. We're going to put a flat on the front ball. And that is the only side that's going to get the flat. There's no need to go around the back. Very gently, gently center drill the front because the part will flex. It's almost impossible for it not to. And a little bit deeper on the back because of the size of that feature. Pilot drill for the brooch. This is an 093 drill. It's going to be an 094 hole. And with any kind of luck, it doesn't leave any scars. This is an 059 drill. Going to come back through it with a 116th or an 0625 reamer. Slow it down a little bit. Just push it through. First cut is the hardest. Watch it flex a little bit. There you go. 
Now, since this is going point to point on the, the X axis and the Y axis, you really can't make equal shifts. If you want a 2,000th bigger square, you have to do some little bit of math right there to figure out exactly how far you need to move the brooch. But you can see that the impact on the part is minimal after it starts to cut, but the initial impact will move the part. So do not go right directly to your number. We're shooting for the 094. All the parts are 093. All the square parts on the model are 093, but the print calls for 0.1. And I showed you once before while I was making that crank last time. That is just too much. I like it a little bit tighter. Now we're going to shave another thousandth or so. And when I put my finger on like that, it means uh, two things. It serves two purposes. I can tell if it's deflecting, and it also lets me know if it's making a clean cut. If it is flexing, it can help keep it in line and cut exactly the way I want it to. Okay, now we take the piece out. We're going to go back over to the lathe, put the undercut in, the radiuses, cut it off, and finish this up. Success. Alright, let's take a look at this little guy before we move over to the lathe. I elected to only put a flat on one side of this because it gives me a little bit more length of engagement with the stem that's going through there, and there's really no reason for the back side to be flat. There's nothing engaging. There is one on both sides. Now, originally when I made this part, the very first operation when I faced the material off, that was my digital readout zero. So what I would like to do is I would like to coordinate this part with the original facing tool with the digital readout to zero but I don't want to cut the part. So I'm going to put a piece of sacrificial material in the collet. I'm going to face it off to zero, and I'm going to set a stop with a second tool holder that I'm going to use to set the position of this part when I put it back in. Let's take a look. I realized after the fact that the tool that I will be leading off with for the second operation after the milling will be this undercut tool. So I want the leading side of the tool that's making the cut right now, I want that to be my zero plane. So I'm facing the part off with the undercut tool, locking the carriage, setting the digital to zero. Do not move the carriage at this point. Cross slide, fine. Compound, new. Carriage, no. Precision ground drill blank. Moved into position on the opposite side of the tool block. Do not move the carriage. Move the drill blank. Gentle pressure on the drill blank on the clamp screws. Bump it up against the part. Secure the clamp screws. Now you have a material reference location for the tool that you will follow up with. When we get around to actually cutting the real parts, I've loaded the part in the collet. And now I'm going to go back and grab that tool holder with the drill blank in it. Lock the tool holder down and gently move the carriage until that drill blank bumps the part. Gently. And I can't say gently soft enough. You do not want to collapse that front hole or leave a flat on this ball. Once you've made contact and you are happy with the repeatability, zero out your digital readout and start the part. Knowing exactly where that undercut tool is makes it very easy to put the back side undercut in this part. I am located right directly in the middle of that undercut, so a second cut is necessary to bring the front to width, the diameter, and off we go. I'm going to turn the back 156 diameter with the same tool since it's already in. Why not? Changing over to a radius tool now. This is an 093 radius tool. It's the same tool I used to do the front of that feature. But now the machine is running in reverse and the tool is inverted. If the part's going to grab and break off and ruin your day, this is where it's going to happen. So be very careful. Make sure everything is perfect. And it looks a little bit more like a ball when we're done. I'm going to put the 078 radius tool in for the lead of the third feature, the back side ball. And go back and grab that undercut tool and establish... The overall length of the part. I believe it's 568. Just so I don't have to file for three weeks trying to make that backside round, I'm going to take the majority of the material out with a 45 degree tool. 
Don't go too deep with this or you end up with a flat on your radius. A couple of files, a couple of minutes. Get it close. I will probably finish this off in the bushing that I had discussed previously. Once you're pleased that it resembles something that's round, feel free to cut it off. Call it a day. Okay, after you part it off, this is what you have. Center diameter finished, front ball finished. The back ball is close, but I would say that once you put it in the bushing and spin it, you can use a file or the form tool to get that a little closer. But be careful of form tool pressure. I would highly recommend that you file that. Okay, if anybody's curious what the next bushing looks like, it is a 187 diameter drilled and 125 diameter drilled and then split on the bandsaw. This will now hold on the 187 center diameter and the 125 ball on the end, exposing the 156 on the outside for final machining. Be very careful when you squeeze the part now, that broach in the center does weaken the part and make sure that you orient the round with this cutout here, because if you orient the flats with the cutout, there's not a whole lot of material hanging on. Do it. Okay, just to clarify, when you load a part like this into that bushing, you want that bushing as far into that collet as you can push it, and you also want to look down the split line of that bushing and see through the broach feature. So the flats are perpendicular to the split line of the bushing. Keep the round part of the part nested in the round part of that bushing. Failure to do so, the part will grab and spin, and that's not a good thing. Okay, after the final lap of forming the 156 ball on the end, this is what you should come up with. That is a very small piece. In comparison, here's a penny. I made two. The print calls for two, but I can only find out where to put one of them. And the brass setup piece that I made for coordinating all the tools. I'll find a use for this little sucker. So there you go. That is an awful lot of work for a very small piece and coordinating the tools is really important if you want to be able to do this with any kind of efficiency. I do have a video on coordinating tools if you want to watch it. Maybe I'll put the link up here somewhere. Move that out of the way, so it'll be up in this area somewhere. And I'll show you exactly what I mean in that video. It's definitely worth watching if you have a digital readout, travel dial, or such. So, that's a wrap for today, guys. Wherever you are in the world, hope you're well, happy, and safe. All the above. I am Joe Pye at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. I'm out.